Shall we pray? Father, we just look up to you. Breathe on this message. Open the ears and understand of your people. And let your counsel be established even this morning. In Jesus' mighty name, we are praying. Praise the Lord. Can you open with me to Hebrews? Let me begin from chapter 6 from verse 9. I want to share with you this morning a message that I consider very, very important. So please, you help me do something. Anyone who's by your side who seems to be trying to fall asleep, please just give them a kick and wake them up. Now, the message in a summary is this. God is saying to you that you can be better than who you are today at this moment. You can be better. In fact, I title it, Be Better Than You Were. Be better than you were. I mean, if you assess yourself, you have reason to give thanks to God that you have made progress. You have grown in the grace of God up to this time. But that may not be the case with everybody because I know some people have not really grown at all. And there's something that is fearful about what Jesus said. He said, to him that has, it shall be given. And he that had not, even that which he has, it shall be taken from him. So which means to say that in the things of the spirit, you cannot afford to mark time. You cannot remain stagnant. You can't stay at the same point. It's either you are increasing or you are decreasing. So, I want to tell you this afternoon that you, you have everything working for you to be better. By the end of this year, you should be able to look at, your, at every area of your life and say, yes, I thank God I'm not where I, I was at the beginning of the year. And to make that real, that's why this message is coming. Now, in Hebrews, let's begin from verse 9. I, I read this when we were having the communion last Sunday. I didn't know I was going to preach very soon. But I, I'll be teaching, really. And if I'm preaching also, uh, let's combine the two. So mind, don't mind me if, I, if I'm doing both preaching and, and teaching. Now, verse 11. Okay, verse 9, beg your pardon. But beloved, we are persuaded better things of you. We here is like, I look at it beyond, I look, that way beyond the, the right of, the, of this book of Hebrew. I see God the Father, God the Son, the Holy Spirit saying, look, we, we made you, and there's a reason why we made you. We're going to make you better than what you are. We are determined to make you better. We have promised you eternal life. We have promised you to be a father to you. We have promised to bring you to the best. And this promise cannot be changed, for God is not a liar. That's why if you begin to read down, I think we, let's try and read it down so that, we, uh, so that I can expand. Okay, so the, the writer began to say, but beloved, we are persuaded better things of you. Notice it's not better things for you. There are better things for you this year, really. But if we're going to get the better things for you, you must, you, you, it, it, it hinges or it depends on whether you, you allow God to work his work in your life so that you can get the better things. Many people don't know that there are some things God will not give you until you grow up. <laughs> if you are praying for a car and you are asking for a car and you, God knows that you are not mature to get, to get a car, he won't give you. The prosperity of fools do destroy them. So if you've been wondering, ah, why is my prayer not answered? Why is it that I'm not getting some things? It's because you have, you have not allowed God to work his work in your life. You see, before God will bring some promise to pass, he must be sure that you are ready for the thing he wants to give you. All right, that's not why I'm stopping. I don't want to, I don't want to preach. <laughs> I just want to teach. But if you find me preaching, just take me. And I'm not rushing. So when it is time, Pastor, please, just give me a signal. I wonder where I get to is where I get to. Maybe the rest will be for another day. But today what I want to just do is that I want to show you why you, are, you can be better. And I want to tell you what you must do to be better. Two things. Why you can be better 
and what you must do to be better. Now, let me read on. For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love, which you have showed toward his name, in that you have, you, that you have ministered to the saints and do minister. And this is what you have done. Many of you have labored. You have served God, and you are wondering why, why, why? Why am I not getting things? Why are things not getting better? Now, verse 11. And we desire that every one of you do show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope unto the end. So that's to say, if I'm going to be diligent, if I'm going to work harder, I, should just, I shouldn't just work hard because I, 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 I want to get, I, I, I want to show God that, that I'm, 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 I'm industrious and I'm, I must be working hard for something that is the hope. I must be working hard to get what he has promised, not what I want. You shouldn't be working hard to get what you want. But you should be working hard to get what God wants for you. What God has promised you. And you must be diligent about it. Praise the Lord. For when God had made a promise to Abraham because he could swear by no greater, he swore by himself. So the writer begins to tell us an example now. How God promised Abraham. You know Abraham, God gave him a promise. But God didn't give, bring the promise until after 25 years. God promised him a child. But God could not give him a child until Abraham rested in God and Abraham died to himself. He had to die to himself before God gave, brought to pass that promise. The Bible said he did not consider his body that was dead, but he staggered not at the promise of God, but he was giving glory to God. All right, so now, so the writer tells us here, he said, God spoke to Abraham, saying, Surely, blessing I will bless thee, and multiplying I will multiply you. And so, after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. For men verily swear by the greater, and an oath for confirmation is to them an end of, of all strife. When God willing more abundantly to show unto er, to the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel, confirm thee by an oath. So, in those old days, when people want to stop any ag disagreement or any strife or any trouble, what they do is that they will cut a covenant. And once they cut the covenant, the matter is settled. Because nobody will go against the covenant. Because they will pronounce curses and blessing. If I, if I, should, if I should renege on my promise, let God do to me what is done to these goats. You know what they will do in those days? They will slaughter the goat, then you pass through the, the, two, the two pieces. And then you proclaim the blessing. You proclaim the cause. If I don't promise, if I don't do what I said, let this happen to me. And of course, you know, it, it, it's not a joke. It's not a joke. So God wanted to show to you that He cannot change. He cannot lie. He, he, he gave the promises. All the promises are based on the covenant. They are yea. It's not amen. Uh, it's not. It's not no. It's yea and amen. And that means that God cannot change His mind. God cannot reverse. You know, I told you. When it comes to the plan of God, it is irreversible, irreducible, irrevocable. Nothing can change it. It is God's desire that before the end of this year, you are better off. I wish you can just see the, the glory that is ahead of you. I hope you can lift up your head and see like Jesus saw. The Bible says he saw the glory that was ahead of him. He despised the shame. And he endured the cross. Let me tell you, what you are going through now is just temporary. Some of the challenges you have had is just temporary. Let me tell you, if you begin to do what you should do, uh, the devil is in, is in trouble. All the barriers, the crooked place, all the mountains, all the hills, all those things that are there will give way. They will give way because the glory, your glory must break forth this year. I am saying your glory must break forth this year. The things that accompany salvation, one of the things that accompany salvation is the glory of God in your life. Do you know that if you give yourself to God this year, hmm, there's a glory that you, cannot, you, cannot, you have not seen. You know what the Bible says? The Bible says, eyes have not seen, ears have not heard. What God has prepared for those who wait on him, or those who will do what they should do. There's a glory ahead of you. Eyes have not seen it. The ramification, the, the dimension of it, you don't know. I pray for you today that you'll be diligent to do what you should do. You will not give up. You will not slack back. 
Those who slap back don't make it. Those who look back do not qualify for the kingdom. Praise the Lord. Now, if you see this chapter of the Bible. It's like, to me, the pivot point. Big Batayo, they are Balameji. Or Rolon, Tunja de Bon. The Bible would add, anyway, Latte de Koshi, Latte Bere. And don't call away, Otiko, so I'm going to call it by Jesu. Oh, son, it's by Jesu. But she moved Jesu D, and he told Daraju. Jesu. Baby, those of my way. He was made better than angels. Odaraju in Awangel law. Odaraju Mose law. Odaraju Tatunia, Aaron law. Chapter 1, chapter 1, Tabaka, chapter 1. In chapter 1, you see the writer began to talk about how God made Jesus better than angels. And he gave the reason. The reason why Jesus was made better is because. It is the plan of God from the beginning that he should be the son of God. At his so so tell it. E ni ni wo yo je omo bibinu mi kon shosho. Thou this day are thou I mean this day have I begotten you. Thou art my son. This day have I begotten you. And there was another word again. Thou art a priest after the order of Melchizedek forever. So it was ordained. He had, God had planned for him from the beginning. And you know what? Jesus is not different. I keep saying it. Jesus is not different from, from us. The only difference between us and Jesus is that he was not contaminated with sin. But the Bible said he was he partook of flesh and blood. Do you, do, you, do you agree with that? He was just like any man. He didn't come in form of angel. He didn't come in form of, he didn't come in form of uh, any other creature. He came as a man. Every weakness you can talk about, he experienced it. Every temptation you can talk about, he experienced it. Everything you can talk about in the world that you are going through, he went through it. Because some of us would have said, ah, 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 but God decided that, look, I am sending my son into this world. You will not take the form of angel. You will not take the form of any super, super being. But you will come in that weakness. For as it is written, what the Lord could not fulfill. God sending his son in the likeness of sinful flesh. In the likeness of sinful flesh. It, the only thing was that he, there was no sin in Jesus Christ. To ever see that. God has, God can make what looks so weak to become very strong. To make everyone know that what looks so weak can become very good. What looks so imperfect can become perfect. What looks so, what looks so, uh, what looks so impossible can be possible with God. So in chapter one, the writer said it was made better than angels. He, be, he had to suffer there, he tasted there, so that he may bring many sons unto glory. And because he had obtained a more excellent name, and because God has ordained it so, he, he, was, he was made better. He was made better. And so in chapter 5, of course, before you got to, uh, you got to chapter 5, he said he was also better than Moses. Because Moses was a servant, he was faithful in all his house. And, uh, but, but, but in the case of Jesus, Jesus as a son was uh, being also faithful. He was better because he was not just a servant. He was the builder of that same house. And the builder is more, the one who is, is a builder is greater than the one who is, just, who is just a servant in the house. And then finally he came to chapter 6 and began to talk about Aaron. How Jesus was made better than Aaron. Jesus was better than Aaron because he had no sin. He didn't need to offer sacrifice for his own sin first. Like, the, like Aaron would first of all offer his own for his own sin, before he now offer for the children of Israel. And, for, and then he went on now to tell us, now if you begin now to move to chapter 7, chapter 8, chapter 9, and chapter 10, you begin to hear again how Jesus came as a, as a high priest to open a new and living way for us through his own body. He offered his own body. And that body as a tabernacle, okay, he offered it to secure for us 
a, a, a better covenant. So that by his blood, what the blood of bulls and goats could not avail, could not produce, by his blood, he had perfected once and for all, once and for all, all those who believe in him. So when you are talking about perfection, it is already done. As far as God is concerned, it is done. Done. The, the deal is done. It is done. And so, access now, in Hebrews chapter 10, verse two, if you read from verse 26 to 29, access has been opened for all. Unlike what it was in the, in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, it was only once in the year that the high priest could enter into the earliest of all. Once in a year. Can you imagine? Can you imagine if you had to pray to God once in a year and get his presence once in a year? Can you imagine? But now, you have 24-7 access to the presence of God. There's no time, there's nowhere, there's no place where you call on God, you desire the presence of God, that God will not show himself on your behalf. You don't have to go to that mountain that Jesus said, or come to this mountain before you can get his presence. Now imagine that you have, you have such an access and you can now call God your father and God is ready to, to relate with you as his son. What then are you telling me that God cannot do in your life? If you, if you do what is necessary. I am, I, I, am, I am saying to you this morning and I am telling you that every resources all you need for life and for godliness. All you need to be a partaker of the divine nature. All you need, the resources of heaven. Every spiritual blessing. Every spiritual enablement. Every spiritual help. Every spiritual, you know, uh, understanding and resources of wisdom and, 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 and knowledge that you require. Has, has been made available for your perfection. And so, for that reason, you ought to be better. Better than angels. You are not in the class of angels. The Bible tells us that. The Bible says they are ministry spirits. To minister to us as heirs of salvation. They are not in our class. And you know what? Even though we are weaker than angels, we can be, we can be stronger than angels. There are some things that angel, some angels will not be able to do. They can't, they can't do some things. It's only man that will do it. <laughs> May God open your eyes. You are supposed to be better than the prophets. You are not in the class of the prophets of old. You know what Jesus said somewhere? He said, the least in the kingdom of God is greater than John the Baptist. I don't know whether you have read that before. I don't know. But you are not, suppo you are not supposed to be at the same level of the, of the Old Testament believers. Because God has determined to make you better than them. You are better than them. And if you cannot do what they did, then that's a shame. If you are, if you are not doing better than Moses, if you are not doing better than John, if you are not doing better than Elijah, if you are not doing better than who again? Abraham, then we have not reached the mark. We have not. The Lord is asking me to tell you that you can be better in so many ways. So many ways. You are supposed to be stronger than your enemy. You can be so strong that you don't need to depend on another person again. Some of you are still depending on pastor, prayer, the prayer of the pastor. You need to be better than that. Some of you, you, you don't know how to open the scriptures and find insight and find revelation. You should be better than that. Some of you don't know how to operate in the things of, of the gifts of the spirit. You should be better than that. Some of you, a little, a little trouble like this will knock you down. You are, you are discouraged. You know, you lose, you lose all your confidence. You don't even remember who you are. You should be better than that. You should be better than that. Some of you, you know, you, you look at yourself and you write, off your, you, write off, you write off yourself and say, well, can any good thing come out of, out of this person? You should be better than that. You should be better. The season we're in now calls 
that we, we, we strive for better things. Strive for better things. Strive for a better you. Strive. That's the call of the gospel message. Strive to be better. Strive to be better. And how can you strive to be better? Can I, can I tell you how God, in a nutshell, let me summarize in a nutshell, how God made Jesus better. What God, how, what God did for Jesus was that he gave him the same platform he has given you. Jesus did not have any other platform. And what is that platform? Intimacy. The presence of God. That was what God made available to Jesus. Hello, somebody. Through the Holy Spirit. You know, Jesus was filled with the Holy Spirit from, from birth. By the age of 12, Jesus was already digging into scriptures. He had to dig into scripture. The Bible prophesied in Isaiah, which I've read to you before, that before he becomes, uh, before uh, he becomes, uh, how did he put it? He would have learned to eat honey and discern between evil and good. He had to, he had to l- attend to the scriptures. And not only that, the father was always there to guide him. And no wonder, by the age of 12, he was confounding the, the, the scholars, the Bible scholars of his days. They asked him questions, he answered it. He asked them questions, they could not answer it. Can you imagine? 12-year-old boy, where did he get the wisdom? In the closet. So no wonder when he began to ministry, when he began to preach, one of the first things he began to preach about is relationship. The closet, the closet. How you are supposed, you and I are supposed to take advantage of the closet. How you and I are supposed to stand in the grace. How we are supposed to take advantage of that of that salvation, beloved. I want you to understand that your salvation, the salvation that you have received, the the opportunity to be saved that have been given to you, is for you to to move on from one degree of experience to another degree of experience. What is salvation? Salvation is, is simply an access to the Father that gives you opportunities for all resources of heaven to be made available to you in order for you to, be, to experience a better transformation, for you to experience translation, for you to experience transfiguration, that there may be a change in your life for the better. And no matter where you are, you know, if Jesus without sin needed to be perfected, how much more we that have sin? Uh, oh yeah, answer now. What, what do you think? Think about it in your heart. What should, what, 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 who should desire the presence of God the more? <laughs> but you know, Jesus never joke with prayer. Jesus never missed the place of the closet. He walked like Enoch with God. He took his time. The Bible said it was his custom. Jesus had a custom. That's to say he maintained an unbroken fellowship with the Father, he walked with the Father. He gave himself to the Father. He understood that relationship with the Father is all that was necessary to be perfected. Now, we were sharing this on the school, and I let, let me say this again because I know this may not have been spoken, this may not have been shared during this on the school. In that outline you have, if you are talking about, about a worshiper, a worshiper that God is seeking, a worshiper is someone. It's not just someone who sings praises, who, you know, who leads uh, praises and know all of that. That's not, that's the I understand a lot of people have. To be a worshiper simply means you have three things in place. You are standing on a tripod stand. Hello, somebody. The Lord told me that a lot of Christians are not, are not standing on a tripod stand. A lot of Christians are not standing. And those who are standing are standing on one leg or two legs. They're not standing on three legs. When I say tripod stand, I mean a three-legged stand. I'm sure you have seen those video cameras, those who camera, those video cameras you know, in the television stations. Those who are photographers, sometimes you need a tripod stand to be able to shoot and take photographs or take a shot. And if the surveyors too, when they are, they are arranging their theodor light, they use a tripod, a tripod stand so that the thing can balance. And so you can maneuver it, turn 
almost any degree of, uh, uh, of, of fear of you. Okay? So, the Lord said, a lot of us are not standing in this platform. A lot of us are not standing in the grace of God. Give me Romans chapter 5. Give me Romans chapter 5. A lot of Christians are not standing in the grace of God. And he's telling you today, stand. Stand and walk. Stop behaving like a baby. Only babies crawl. Babies don't know how to use their legs. Babies don't use their legs. They use their hands. They use their knees. And sometimes, some don't even know how to use the knees. They only roll. They just roll. God said, I have given you legs. Stand in the grace. Look at that. He said, therefore, being justified by faith, we have what? Peace with God. So, no more enmity. The enmity that was there has been removed. We were enemies of God. We were aliens before. But when you believe Jesus, the first thing that he gives to you is justification. Everybody say justification. Say it again. What is justification? Justification simply means you are free to enter his presence without condemnation. Hello? When you go before the presence of God, even when you are, when you are imperfect in your weakness and all of that, God does not look at you as a sinner. He looks at you as a child. You are justified in his presence. And that gives you peace. You know, a lot of you, you worry, you worry, you worry. You are, you, are, you are troubled by your sinfulness and all that. Don't let that be your focus. Put away, you, you, put away your eyes from yourself. I'm not saying you should condone sin. But don't let your sin make you sit down and remain in a situation. Stand on your feet. Stand in the liberty where which you have been made free. Stand. He says, having peace with God, therefore, through our Lord Jesus Christ, we have what? We stand. Give me the next verse. Give me the next verse. Verse 2. By whom also we have access, you look at that, you see that, by faith, into what grace? This grace. This grace that he's talking about is the same grace that he extended to Abraham. That same grace that gave Abraham ability to, to fulfill the promise of God and enjoy the promise of God. It's the same grace that God has extended to you. So there's no promise of God that you cannot, you cannot receive. There's no promise of God you cannot, you cannot claim. There's no promise of God that you cannot experience. It is given to everybody. And God is no respecter of persons. In any nation, whoever fears God and does what is right is accepted. He's no respecter of persons. He says, stand. It says, where do we stand? That is what makes us stand. And we have to stand in that grace. Now, hear me, beloved. Hear, 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 hear this. Salvation is a platform. A platform given to you to walk thereby and experience everything of God. It is an access that God gives to you so that you start from where you are and you receive grace for grace, grace upon grace, grace little by little, little by little, little by little. As you, you, as you, as you walk with God, you obey his instruction. You do what you know. You do the little you know. As you do the little you know, grace is added to grace. Grace is added to grace. Truth is added to truth. More truth, more grace. More truth, more grace. More truth, more grace. And as you walk in the truth you have known, as you continue steadfastly in that which you know, your life is transfigured. It's not by power, it's not by mind, it's not by struggle. Beloved, I want you to understand this. I want you to understand this, that you have to stand. You have to stand. You need to stand. Now, what are the three legs that you need to stand? Now, let me, because of the time, can I give you Acts chapter, can you give me Acts chapter 2? Give me Acts chapter 2. The triple stand, let me write this down. The three legs you must have and stand are, one, prayer, fellowship in prayer communion. Two, fellowship in God's word. Three, fellowship with other believers. This is your tripod stand. 
This is your tripod stand. I repeat. Number one, personal fellowship in prayer or personal communion with God. That's number one. That's the main leg. That's your main leg. The other ones are just supporting legs. So number one, personal fellowship. So what you are learning in the Sunday school now, please, everything you are, you are being instructed to do, all the things you are learning, please put it to practice, put it to practice, put it to practice, put it to practice. Now I'm going to pick one of these legs and talk about each of these three legs in a very short time and I'll, I'm done. That's the end of the message. So number one, Prayer fellowship, communion with the Father. Number two, fellowship in God's word. And number three, fellowship with the believers. Now, let me begin by, by, by picking them one by one. But before I read that, can I have Acts chapter 2? Let's read from verse 41. This was what the early believers, they, they did. And that explains why they experienced growth. The church grew to be strong. The church of Pentecost was a strong church. The church of Pentecost was a glorious church. The church of Pentecost was a Christ-like church. Christ-like church. The church of Pentecost was, was a church that, that witnessed the presence of God. Every time they gathered, the Spirit of God came upon them. They were baptized again and again and again and again. The times of refreshing came upon them. It was not one time it was not just two times, several times, again and again and again and again and again, as occasion warranted, the Spirit of God came upon all. They were all filled with the Spirit. There was not a single person who was not filled with the Holy Spirit. They were genuine. Every believer in, in, in the church at Jerusalem was a genuine believer. Not, not the fake, so not, not the mixture of fake, fake and, and, and original as we have in our churches today. So what was the secret? Every one of them continued. Everyone say continued. continued. Say it again. Continued. Say it again. Continued. And how did they continue? Daily. Everyone say daily. daily. Say it again. Daily. 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 So they continued daily, 24-7. 24-7, they took advantage of the access to, into this grace that we're talking about. And daily, God added to them. Everyone say, God added to them. <laughs> you see, God is, so, 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 God is so, such a one mighty ocean. You can't exhaust the resources of God. If you want to take it every day, he's ready to give you every day. If you want to take it e every month. I used to remember in those days, there's this uh, illustration that uh, this man of, man of God usually uses. He said, uh, if you want to get the resources of God, don't bring a cup. Go and take a tanker. Eh? Take a tanker. Don't take a cup. If you take a cup, you only get the refreshing for that moment. But if you take a tanker, you, will take, you load the tank with such a such magnitude volume of water, and you, you, are, you, are never, you never run dry. So what did they do? Verse 42. Give me verse 42. Okay, before then, they, they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Now, verse 42. And they continued. Everybody say it again. Continued. continued. Jesus said, if you continue in my word, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Consistency is the, is the watch word. Hello, beloved. Consistency in these three legs. You must keep stretching these three legs. You must keep, keep stretching these, these three legs. As you keep on stretching these three legs, and as you keep working on these three legs, you, are, you will make progress. If I was leaving the elementary doctrines of God, let us move on to what? Perfection. So the Bible said they continue steadfastly in what? The apostles' doctrine, number one. And in what? Fellowship. What kind of fellowship? Corporate fellowship and personal fellowship. And not only that, and in what? In breaking of bread and in prayers. So, read, okay, give, let, give me the next one. Give me the next one. Verse 43. 
and fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. Go to verse 46. Go, go to verse 46. Let, let's read that verse also. And they continued daily in one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. Now, if you combine verse 41, 42, 46, you will find the three legs. You will find the three legs. They had personal fellowship. They had fellowship in God's word. They continued see, in the apostles' doctrine. means they didn't just stop to hear. They didn't just stop to hear. And what is the apostles' doctrine? The doctrines of Christ. Because the, the apostles didn't teach any other thing. It was what they received from Christ that they, they were passing on. And if you ask me, what are the doctrines of Christ? Hebrews chapter 6 itemizes the doctrines of Christ. Faith towards God. Sorry, repent, starting from repentance from dead works. Faith towards God, number two. Uh, uh, of, uh, doctrine of laying of hands, number three. Of baptisms, number four. Resurrection from the dead, number five. And the last one, number six, eternal judgments. Now, I, I want to ask you this question. How many of you have ever taken time to, to break through and look at what these doctrines are talking about? How many of us are, are endeavoring to not just depend on what you are getting in the church, in the church service, but you are also doing your own study. You are also doing your own doctrinal study. I, 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 I was teaching last, uh, is it last year or two years ago, and I was saying that as a Christian, you must not just, you must not just uh, do study Bible or only for devotion alone. There are three ways of doing devotional, I mean, of doing the, st the study of the Bible. Number one, devotional study. When you, when you read from chapter to chapter and then you write down what you learn, the, the, the promise to, to, to hold, the commandment to follow, the instruction to follow, that's devotional. But that is, that is as its own place. If that is the only one you are doing, you are, not doing, you are not doing well enough, you must combine with doctrinal study. And there's a third one that we were not taught. I call it inspirational study. Inspirational study. So, three legs. Three legs again. Number one, devotional study. You read the Bible from, from Genesis down as far as you can go. I've tried it. They say we should read the Bible uh, uh, once in a year. I've tried it. I try to read the Bible. And every time I get to some chapters, I get stuck. And I may be on a chapter for days. So, I discover that invariably I cannot finish the whole Bible in a year. But over the years now, I've read through every portion of the Bible. So, devotional study, you must do it. Doctrinal study means take a topic. What does the Bible say about faith towards God? Or what does the Bible say about, about uh, uh, repentance from dead work? Or what does the Bible say about resurrection? Find out. Don't, don't, lean on, don't lean on any man. Because you have an anointing that teaches you all things. And you need not any man to teach you. That's not to say... I'm not condemning the place of the pastor. I'm not condemning the place of the fivefold ministry. That is good. But I am telling you that what builds you up, what builds your faith, is the personal study you have with God. That's what builds you. The personal study you have with God is what builds you. And the Bible says you should study in such a way that you are proved of God, a workman that needed not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. You must be able to divide the word of truth. When some people divide the word of truth, I, I look at it, I, I ask myself, did those people spend time in the presence of God long enough to meditate? Some divide the word so shabbily, so shallow. Some divide the word and confuse everything together. But if you spend time enough in the presence of God, and you ask God questions, and you allow him to speak into your life, you will be able to divide the word accurately. You do not need any man to teach you some things. There are some things that are personal to you. There are sacred, secret promises. There are secret, there are certain portions of the Bible that are, that are written in the volume of your book. You've got to search it out. Study means going line by line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little, and checking out to be sure that this, that you are, your heart is 
is, you know, is well up, is, is established. And if you are able to get at least three witnesses of the Bible, of the scriptures, you, are, you, are, you, are, you have had it. You, you are correct. So, standing on the promise, on, on, the, on the leg of the, of the doctrine of the scriptures is very important. Then what was the other thing again? They were, they were given to prayers. They continued steadfastly in prayer. They continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. They continue steadfastly in prayers. Now, prayer is another important leg. Now, don't tell me that you, you, you are so good, you are so nice, you are so done, that you don't need, you, can't, you must not set time for prayer. You must set time for prayer. And like we have read in Matthew chapter 6, the reason, the essence of prayer, of seeking personal, I mean, prayer fellowship, is for you to discover the secret things about your life in the secret place. It's, it, prayer is not about, a lot, a lot of people misunderstand things. You know what, how Jesus prayed? The Bible said, even in the days of his prayers, when he had offered up cries and supplication with strong, with strong tears, he was hurt in that he feared. Now, have you taken time to analyze that scripture very well? When I first read that scripture, when, when I was a young, young guy in the faith, I thought, the Bible was talking about, the first impression I had in my spirit was that it was referring to God, God no guessing money. But the Holy Spirit came to me and said, no, 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 don't think that way. Don't you see, read it again. And when I read it again, my eyes caught the word days. Days. Not in the singular. But in the word? In the word? Plural. So which means that account in Hebrews chapter 5, verse 6 is not just talking about the Gethsemane experience, he's talking about what Jesus went through. He was, he was cornered with death. And the death we're talking about now, you all know, is spiritual death, not, not, uh, not physical death. It could have also been physical death. But I, 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 I guess and I understand very clearly that more particularly it is spiritual death. Do you, I keep telling people that Jesus, was, Jesus was, 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 didn't have that, that super power or super being uh, nature that made him invincible or insulated from sin. That was why he was tempted. You think the devil did, didn't believe that he can tempt him and make him fall into, the sin, into sin like the first Adam? If, I mean, the devil tried him every way, in every corner. And that was how, you know, he had to pray. So his own praying was not just praying for, praying for mundane things. Jesus used prayer as a means of drawing life. Life upon life. Life upon life. And each time he, he, he prayed, like he prayed in Garden of Gethsemane, he was strengthened by God. He was strengthened by God to overcome. Now, if you don't know how to pray and get to a level where you can use prayer to get wisdom and get insight and get life from the presence of God to overcome the forces of evil that are warring against your members, sorry, you have not understood what prayer is all about. And finally, let me, I'm running up. Finally, the third leg was that they, they broke bread from house to house. They, they fellowship together with other believers. They had these three legs in place. And because they had these three legs in place, you know what happened to them? The ministry of the apostolic ministry, the ministry of the teachers, the ministry of the prophets, the fivefold ministry of, of Christ, which was shared abroad among the twelve, caused the grace of God to be ignited in them. Now, I, I normally say this, I normally say this, and that is in conjunction with the, laying, the doctrine of laying of hands. There's a time when you are weaker than your enemy, when you are immature. At that point, that you need a kickstarting. You know the car, a car has a kickstarter. When you put the key and you turn it, what you are simply doing is that you are opening the battery supply so that the current can flow to the kickstarter. That's what we call a kickstarter so that it can push to roll the engine. And once the engine begins to roll, the, the mechanical system begins to work on its own. If you disconnect the battery, it won't affect it because it will be generating electricity by itself through the coil. So the battery is only needed to kickstart. After it has kickstarted, you don't need battery again. The only reason why the battery remains there is so that it can, be, it can be charged for the next assignment. You understand what I'm saying? Laying of hand is for a, a period of time when you are young. 
There's a time you must have grow. You come every now and then, they must lay hands on you. Every now and then, they must lay hands on you. Two years after you give your life to God, they must lay hands on you. Laying of hands is just for a temporary period. When you are, you are impacted by the grace of God, when hands are laid on you to impact the Holy Spirit, baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Once you, once you have been baptized with the Holy Spirit, you are, supposed to, you are supposed to turn into a firebrand and begin to minister to others. You should be looking for the devil, where his work is at work, and begin to deal with the devil. So, beloved, I want, us to, I want us to be encouraged. I want us to know that when a believer understands these three legs and begins to walk in these three legs and follow the instruction of the Lord, the Lord himself will be the one changing his life, transforming his life. It's not by his trouble. All that God wants us to do is just walk. You just obey. Find time. All that God requires of you is find time to be in his presence. Number two, make sure you obey his instruction. Whatever you hear from him, do. And number three, just give him his, uh, your heart. Don't let another thing contest for your heart. And know that the journey does not end one day. Just continue. That's why in Romans, give me that Romans chapter 5. Let's go on. Let's go back to that Romans chapter 5. He said, wherein we stand. Let, let's read it to, to verse 6. Go, go back to, I'm, I'm, I'm closing now. Romans chapter 5. Let, let's read on. For when we were without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. Uh -huh. No, go back, go back, go back. Go back to verse 3. Go, okay, give me that verse 2 again. Give me that verse 2 again. Let me start from verse 2. By whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand. And rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. That's to say, when you are brought into this grace, don't think that overnight, the glory will come. It's a lie. You, you should rather have a, a hope. That What is a hope? A hope is, is different from faith. Faith is different from hope. Faith is a substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. So in other words, if I have faith, that does not mean that my faith is going to produce instant time for me. Because that's what that's what many, pe many people may, you know, make us to believe that, ah, if you really believe, then you must get a result, instant result. Let's say, say. That's not like, let's say, say. God is not a magician. What God expects is that when you believe, you'll be like Jesus. Because you're looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. So there's a, there's a beginning and the end. The authoring and the finishing. There's a beginning where you come in into this platform. And this platform of salvation that we're talking about is a road. You have to follow on to know. You follow, if you follow on to know, the Bible says in Hosea chapter, chapter 6 that after two days, which is, which is symbolic, after two days, he will, after he had authors, after we have been smitten, after we have gone through the road, the rugged road, and all the challenges, all the cross on the road, the Bible says after two days, he will raise us up. That's resurrection. Some of you, you only think of resurrection only on, in April. You don't know how resurrection applies to you. You better go and study about resurrection. I'm sorry to say, what the church owes about resurrection is our truth. <laughs> I'm waiting for the day God will give me grace to, to teach on resurrection. I can't teach you because if I teach you now, you will call, you will, some of you will stone me. Uh, so I, I'm careful. I'm careful. So let's, let's, let's make sure that let's, let's look up and not only so, but we glory in tribulations. Do you see that? As we go through that road, whatever comes our way, tribulations, whatever it is, we, we rejoice in hope. We keep rejoicing in hope of the glory of God. We know that after the tribulation, the tribulation is just working for us, a greater weight of glory. So every experience you go across the road, is God using it to, to work out a work in your hearts, work out a work in your life, work out a work in, your, in, your, in you, so that by the end of the day, that that which accompanies salvation may appear on your behalf. Beloved, let ha let's have the right thinking. Let me stop here. Let's go to prayer. Let's go to prayer. Oh, thank you, Father. Thank you. Ah, thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. I want to pray for yourself. Lord,
help me to stand in this grace. Let my three legs stand effectively. Heal me. Heal me of feeble knees. Heal me of weak legs. Heal my legs. Help me to stand. How shall we neglect? How shall we escape if we neglect this great salvation that was, 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 was preached by those who had? Which was first preached by, 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 by Christ and those who had him? How shall we escape? We have no excuse to remain the way we are. We must, we must move on. We must move on to perfection. We must move on. We must move on. We must move on. We must move on. Nothing must limit us. There shall be no limitation. There shall be no limitation. There shall be no limitation. Every barrier we break away from. Every hindrance we break away from. Lord, let healing come. For the scripture says, Arise, O ye that sleepeth. For Christ shall give you life. Christ shall give you life. I command the light of God, the light of life, to rest upon you. The glory of God to raise you up. Stand. Stand. I rebuke every weaknesses. The salvation of God gives you strength. 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 You, you, strength. you will not be weak anymore. You are better than weakness. You are better than weakness. The salvation of God gives you his presence. You will not be without his presence. The presence of God to manifest in your life. I decree to happen. I command it to happen. The glory of God to appear in your life. In the name of Jesus. The Christ of God to manifest in you. Christ to dwell in your heart by faith. Lord, I pray that as you set your people upon the course of, of, this, of this journey. I ask the Lord, as many as are willing, as many as are saying, I refuse to remain ordinary. I ask the Lord, your hand will come upon them. You will quicken them. You will strengthen them. You will enable them according to your promise. Oh, Lord, I thank you. He said, you said to J. Warm Jacob, I will help you. I will strengthen you. Oh, Father, let it be. Let it be. Let it be accomplished according to your promise. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name. Mighty name, we are praying. Amen. Amen.